the continuation of the 2014 Wilderness Issues Lecture Series, Room to Row. Next week, we are going to be featuring Hal Herring, who's an award-winning journalist and writer and author, but from right here in Montana, in, um, who lives along the Rocky Mountain Front. And he will be joining us for a talk titled, Wilderness, Where We Have Come From and Where We Are Going. But this week, we are pleased to bring you two speakers to the lecture series on a topic that I felt was of enough of importance to have multiple voices speak on this particular topic. Uh, first off will be Kevin Hood, who is a wilderness manager coming to us from Juneau, Alaska. He's a wilderness manager for Admiralty National Monument on the Juneau, Juneau Ranger District of the Tongass National Forest. For students that have had me in classes, you probably know that I can't get two jumps away from talking about Alaska, so of course, our lecture series has to have some Alaskan blood. So we've got some this week. Um, Kevin has worked on wilderness for the USDA Forest Service for 19 years. The last 15 years have been within Alaska. He's been a wilderness ranger, a wilderness crew leader. He's also served on advisory boards to the chief of the Forest Service, and he's acted as an agency representative at international conferences on wilderness, such as the World Wilderness Conference. Congress. He and his partner with their two children live in Juneau, Alaska. Also with us tonight, right from here in Missoula, Montana, is Dr. Andrew Larson, who's a UM forestry professor, a professor of forest ecology. He received his PhD in forest resources from the University of Washington in 2009. His research interests include long-term change in forest ecosystems, and examining ecological theories to establish forest restoration targets and help guide restoration treatment design. He's also a 2013 recipient of the National Excellence in Wilderness Stewardship Research Award, which is very exciting. He teaches in the Wilderness and Civilization program here at the University of Montana, and he also created and teaches a wilderness fire ecology course in the Bob Marshall Wilderness every summer for the Wilderness Institute. So if you like his lecture tonight, you should sign up for his field course this summer. Um, so tonight, both speakers are going to present viewpoints on our topic, which is, can we keep wilderness wild? A look at work, research, and science in wilderness areas today and into the future. I would like to welcome our first speaker, Kevin Hood, to the lecture series to start us off. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks, everyone, uh, for coming out. It's uh, it's funny to come from Alaska, where we're having our summertime weather now, and come down here and feel a real winter. So uh, I appreciate everyone coming out on a chilly, chilly evening. Um, I'd like to go ahead and begin by showing a little bit about where I'm working in Alaska. And then also to give you some of my original impressions when I first went up there and started working in wilderness management. And then to talk about how our, what we were doing in the beginning of my career there and how that's changed over time, how our management approach has changed and some of the issues that we are facing and some of the challenges and opportunities I foresee ahead. So I can do my... Uh, this is my map of Alaska. It's the more economical version. Uh, this is the southeast part. You got the Aleutians. <laughs> but um, what I'm going to talk about is uh, the southeast part. It's the Tongass National Forest at 17 million acres. It's the largest national forest. And this is just sort of uh, something I took off wilderness.net. And you can see it's got a quite a interesting island archipelago situation along with some mainland areas has over 2,000 islands and to give you a little context it has uh, about 20 million acres roughly the size of South Carolina and you have about 75,000 people so it's a pretty uh, sparsely populated area we've got a uh, roughly uh, five five point uh, five point eight million acres of wilderness on the Tongass the islands mostly look like this. They have a lot of old growth forest on them. A lot of Sitka spruce, western hemlock. Really beautiful areas. It's very wet there. It rains 
much of the year. And then as you get towards the mainland, you start getting up towards these, uh, whoop, back up a sec. You have these, high, these coastal mountains, and what happens is as you capture all the uh, precipitation off the Pacific Ocean, you get a, a lot of uh, rainfall becomes eventually snowfall that kind of compacts eventually into these uh, ice fields, which uh, feed a lot of glaciers. And so when you're getting into the mainland area, it's starting to look like this, and it's penetrated in a few areas by real deep water fjords. Some interesting juxtaposition of glaciers and old forest. And this is what a tidewater glacier looks like. We have some of the uh, southernmost tidewater glaciers uh, in North America here. And uh, these are harbor seals that haul out here to pup and also to molt, get their winter coats. When I first went up there, I was astounded by the beauty. and everything, Everything's so wild, so raw. Um, when I was a little kid, I grew up in Los Angeles, so this is quite the contrast, and you see all kinds of amazing wildlife. And the wilderness is just off the charts. And you have, when you talk about, the, in the Wilderness Act, sometimes you think about the outstanding opportunities, you know, for solitude or a primitive and unconfined type of recreation. You can find them up there in spades. This is my first, you know, impressions when I was up there in 99 for the first time. And as a wilderness ranger, when I first went up there, we basically just went out and did very kind of old traditional ranger things. We'd go to campsites, we'd look at, do inventories of vegetation loss, uh, pack out the trash other people didn't. Uh, this one's a little harder to see. That's just a we had a little cable we strung up between trees. We actually had the funny situation of it's recently deglaciated and there weren't enough trees to really hang your food from bears. And so we had a guide site that uh, we had to put up a cable so the bears wouldn't get their food. But it was pretty much uh, an attaboy, go out and don't get killed attitude of management. And we just go out and kind of try to go to a new place each time, maybe hit a popular campsite a few times. And if we could, we'd contact people to try to talk to them about wilderness. But I remember in my first year, I, I, I had six weeks where I didn't see another person out there except for my partner. Things began to change, though, and we started to notice a real rise in uh, tourism, especially industrial scale tourism. And we, I remember going out where not only weeks without seeing, you know, I'd see boats occasionally, you know, kayakers, but eventually, you know, I used to still have mostly you know, out of a nine-day hitch, I might go three or four days without even seeing boats. And we started seeing boats more and more and more and more. And Alaska was really experiencing kind of an explosion in recreational tourism. And it got to no matter where you were, you were pretty much in the presence of boats. And we started beginning you know, to think, you know, is this solitude when, you know, you're seeing 5,000 people go by on a cruise ship, you know, and you could hit it with a Frisbee and you go, you know, dinner is now served on the sun deck. It's not the solitude you're picturing, you know, when you're going to Alaska. So we began writing down, well, how, how many are we seeing? You know, what's going on? And we, we started, and our forms have gone through all kinds of evolutions as we're trying to quantify it. This is our current, this is 2011. This is pretty much the current solitude monitoring form we're using, where we're trying to capture everything from uh, aircraft or here and vessel here, closest approaches, and it gets into, did you have any contact with them? Um, were they ashore? And also, how did that just affect you at a subjective rating, low, medium, high? So we got into kind of a real, we're starting to get a little bit more uh, methodical in our assessment of solitude, something we definitely weren't doing in my early years there. We also noticed some other things. <laughs> it wasn't just solitude. They're like having impacts on air quality and people would complain to us about this, even though technically the wilderness boundary ends at the high tide line. They'd be like, well, why are you allowing that to happen? <laughs> it's like, well, it's not on the national forest. It's not wilderness. And then they'd just say, well, yeah, but why are you, they wouldn't, that didn't go anywhere. They'd say, why are you allowing that to happen? And so we actually went and got certified by the Environmental Protection Agency to start monitoring visual air emissions um, it's something Glacier Bay National Park has been doing for a while. And so we started catching up and we partnered with the state. And we started recording because the air quality issues were rather 
they're becoming quite uh, common, unfortunately. And what's interesting is when you look at some of the surveys about how people value wilderness going back over the years, air quality is almost always the number one or number two, or first or second most highly rated wilderness value. I think that sort of indicates how much, you know, the people who uh, are coming out of urban areas where they really want to have clean air. And so we became certified. We'd actually get these weather stations and it's quite an elaborate process. We'd chase these things in our boat and we'd be monitoring the air quality. Another issue was that everybody wanted to get all the way down to the glaciers where the seals are. And every kind of boat, you know, whether from kayakers all the way up to cruise ships. And that habitat's really important to the seals. As I mentioned earlier, it's where they go in order to haul out at around late May till early July to give birth. And then later in the summer, they go there again to haul out and molt and get their winter coat. So it's kind of a sensitive time for them. And we noticed some of the boats in trying to get as close as they could to the glacier. Sometimes they'd also try to get as close as they could to the seals, to where they're just knocking them in the water. Not literally, but, you know, they get close enough to the seal. And we became kind of concerned about that. And there was some research going on at the time, trying to monitor the vessel disturbance done by the state and also the University of Alaska, but their funding fell through. And we'd been doing logistical support to help them set it up. But when the funding fell through, we took over the research, thinking we'll cover it for a year or two to you get your funding back. And we've now been doing it for um, about 11 years. <laughs> Still, I mean, they're actually starting to get a little more engaged again, but it, it's been a lot longer. But we kind of became the experts in harbor seals. And so we'd be off and down there doing population counts and monitoring how they react to the vessels coming in. That's about 1,250 seals. And it's a pain to count them. <laughs> But there's also an opportunity. We weren't only just seeing impacts. Because one thing we realized is we were out there kind of paddling around. We were hardly ever running into people actually camping. We, once in a while we would. But there were so many boats going by, we started getting aboard them to talk to people about wilderness. For the first few years, we really just went out and kind of explored. And it was great. You know, we got to see a lot of cool things. But eventually you kind of realize, you know, is that what it's about? We're trying to actually get people to understand wilderness. You want to have something a little bigger than just your own, you know, enjoyment. And so we began getting on these boats and giving talks. And the people loved it. It was great. First, they're amazed that anybody gets around in kayaks in these areas. And they just ask you millions of questions. Where do you poop? What about bears? Does your mom know what you're doing? That kind of thing. <laughs> you know, you're kind of always hoping for the really, you know, educated, deep questions. And it's always, you know, where do you go to the bathroom? But um, we were able to, you know, this is the map of the wilderness areas. We actually, because we're on the boats for so long, we'd often ride them for about 30 miles or a few hours. And, you know, a lot of the time it's pouring rain. And the people, they'll look outside, but they'll actually more interested to hear your stories. We really had a great connection with the people. And so our education got a lot better. We, we had more uh, richer contacts. We got a lot of good feedback as to, you know, what do people really want to know? And this became a very valuable part of our program, and it still is today. And what's interesting is, in this time, something called the 10-Year Wilderness Stewardship Challenge started around 2004, 2005-ish. And uh, it kind of uh, codified what all we had been doing. And do, do most of you know what this 10-Year Wilderness Stewardship Challenge is? I'm always mindful when you're in Montana. It's, what it is is it's a national uh, program we embarked on for about 10 years. And you have all these different uh, elements of focus that you're doing. And a lot of it was things we were doing. Like, for example, here we have air quality is one thing you might monitor. We also have wilderness education plans here. Recreation site inventories, like our campsite inventories. Um, here's a little bit of direction and monitoring for solitude here. And basically, what this is, this is a list of the 19 wilderness areas on the Tongass. And this is a score as to how well we're doing in each one. This 10-year wilderness stewardship challenge was sort of a quantum leap in wilderness management in that for the first time we had uh, consistency in that all the districts were trying to tend to the same things and we had a very detailed book as to how you could get better in scores. You had to go out, do inventories, come up with a plan, then you had to try to implement the plan and then learn from that and refine your plan further. And then you'd score higher the more of that you achieved, pretty much for most of these elements. 
So we started having real consistent wilderness management. It was much more uh, professional as well. We were working across disciplines. We had plans, multi-year plans going forth. And uh, we were really starting to share a lot of our information with each other. And also, perhaps most importantly, we had some accountability. You know, the field crews, you weren't just being paid to go out and have fun. You actually had to come back and show how you were improving your scores. And maybe even more importantly is our supervisors, line officers, people up above, had to explain why they were or were not succeeding well in this challenge. So this was sort of a good quantum leap. This is where we ended up, uh, this is last year, did even a little better for 2000, or I guess two years ago, 2013. But we had all of these wilderness areas basically scoring high enough to pass this challenge. They had a minimum standard. Where this is now going to go next, I think, is into wilderness character monitoring, which is something that really gets me excited. Because the Wilderness Act, while those efforts were really good with the 10-year Wilderness Stewardship Challenge, there were a few things that were left off the table that were kind of important. And the Wilderness Act basically the fundamental mandate of it is that we have to preserve wilderness character. And so now what we're trying to do is get those, all those things that we had been working on under the 10-year Wilderness Stewardship Challenge and fold a lot of those efforts into working on wilderness character monitoring. And that means tending to things like uh, the natural quality of wilderness. So under that might come our air quality efforts and also perhaps uh, attending to uh, invasive weeds. Things like that would be under your natural aspect of wilderness character monitoring. Um, under undeveloped, you might have your campsite, you know, how developed they are, proliferation of trails, things like that. And so what this represents is sort of a yet another quantum leap forward where we're actually returning to the Wilderness Act itself to make sure our standards of ma management comport with what the law requires. I'm really excited about this. One th other way that our management really evolved, and I'm going to go through this kind of quickly, I apologize, but hopefully in the Q&A session, if there's any questions, we can elaborate further. One other way our management evolved is we came up with something called Wilderness Best Management Practices. This was in the Fjordal area. We're having a lot of uh, conflict between the boating groups. Those giant cruise ships, they don't really mind any other boaters, but everything smaller than a cruise ship hates the cruise ships. And the kayakers basically, it's like the, if, you, if you're in a kayak, you don't like anything bigger than you. You don't mind other kayakers, that's okay. And if you're in like a little, you know, skiff, then you don't mind, you don't mind kayakers, but you don't want anything. And, but there's getting to be some conflict, especially when you get down by the glacier and everybody wants to spend all day there. There's also impacts to seals, we're getting the air pollution issues. And so we came up with this voluntary agreement with 21 different companies, from cruise ships down to kayakers, and what it basically, I think I have the line. These are some of the suggestions. The cruise ships are to basically share the silence. We we're having huge issues. They're blowing horns at each other. And their horns are quite loud, as you can imagine. They're doing their PAs to announce and narrate the entire thing. And when you're in a granite-walled fjord, you can hear their announcements up to three to five miles away. Um, clean. Clear the air. We're trying to get them to use the highest quality fuels because they, they're giant. They're like floating cities. They have all kinds of different fuels depending on where they are. They can burn the cheaper, dirtier fuels or they can burn the more expensive, high grade fuels. We came up with uh, working with the National Oceanic and At uh, Atmospheric Administration. We came up with measures for protecting seals. And uh, we talked a little bit about preserving the Alaskan experience. We actually scheduled all these cruise ships where all the big cruise ships would go down Tracy Arm. That's one of those fjords. And that left the other fjord open for all the smaller boats. What's really interesting about this is we don't have jurisdiction on any of that. <laughs> and so, but we were able to, because there were issues and people were concerned, you know, we were able to get people together. And because we were sort of a neutral party, people agreed to do it. But it's interesting, these are impacts to wilderness. So the, the impacts actually can occur on wilderness, but in terms of what a boat does on the water, that's off the wilderness. And the air quality thing is, again, that's like an EPA relegated to the state, but we partnered with the state. Protecting the seals, we worked with NOAA and also with the university and the state researchers. And then for the Alaska experience, this was kind of agreement the boat operators came on to share the area. So it's kind of a, interesting and sort of a, 
a new way of thinking about pr going beyond your own jurisdictional boundaries to protect your own character. But that raises the question, does it actually protect wilderness character? This is a map from the back. It didn't, it's a little bit blurry, but basically we have all the cruise ships going down here, all the tour boats coming down here. Where's the kayakers to go? We've kind of spread out all this motorized use, so they're not in conflict with each other. You know, and so this is sort of our next thinking now. But it's also been a process. It's like a house of cards almost. They did a study on the Wilderness Best Management Group, and they determined the num everyone was there because they didn't trust anybody else who was there. <laughs> it was funny. They're all nervous that there'd be some agreement made without them, so they all came to make sure nothing happened while they weren't in the room. It wasn't so much, and now we're trying to get it to be more of an incentive thing, and I'm going to try to provide them a lot of educational materials for the 50th anniversary of the Wilderness Act. But it is an interesting quandary. It's something we're still experimenting with. The yellow zones are the zones where we did say, ah, you could use a PA in these few areas. That's where nobody can camp because it's sheer cliffs. But the rest of it, they agreed no PAs for all the rest of it, which is the most of the area. <coughs> So this, this is actually David Cole right there. And this is normally what you are expecting when you come. And this brings me to one of the great concerns I now have as a wilderness manager is I fear that we're losing the outstanding opportunities for solitude. This is what you may easily have in the summer. You know, we have about 200 cruise ship visits a summer. And that's not counting any of the smaller boats, which will be at least as numerous. The some of the state's researchers last year, they recorded in Tracy Arm, they averaged over 15 encounters a day in Tracy Arm, about nine a day in Endicott. And so that's just a concern I have. It's interesting because these users, that's about 5,000 people there. Not a single one of them will actually touch wilderness. So in one way, it's kind of ideal. It's like, God, if you can get 5,000 people to go to your wilderness and leave without leaving any physical impact, you know, that's, you're kind of ahead of the game. But if you're on the wilderness and you're seeing 5,000 people going by and they're all yelling questions like, what are you doing? You know, aren't you freezing? Yeah, we got happy hour. You know, things like that. They're yelling at you. <laughs> that's kind of impacting your experience as well. So it's not as simple as these are all bad and, you know, this is all good. You know, it's a little more complicated than that. But that's one of the concerns I have is trying to preserve solitude here. Another interesting kind of growing concern of mine is the impacts of research in wilderness. And this has started, this is something where I, the longer I've been there, the more I'm finding research. Uh, and I'll talk about installations first, but um, this is some of the SEAL researchers putting things in there. This is the FIA. They did a, they, they had a proposal to use helicopters and they're going to do a few hundred flights into the wilderness areas on the Tongass each summer and set up a bunch of uh, vegetation inventories. And they're going to put in, you know, it was around 10,000 stakes and monuments to kind of, so they could keep returning to these sites and set up, you know, quadrats and things like that. And originally we were just going to say, okay, you know, let us know when you're out there, let us know when you're done. But a few of us were kind of like, you know, this is, we're not really supposed to have our wilderness areas, you know, gridded with stuff where you can't be more than 2.2 miles from any plot center, you know, a bunch of plots and stakes. And the original assessments when they were trying to use helicopters were showing that they were gonna need a lot more flights than they were saying. And so we started raising these concerns. Another concern I have is about the trammeling of wildlife. This is a really big concern of mine because by definition, as most people may know, a wilderness is an area where the earth and its community of life are untrammeled by man. The seal might think it's being a little bit trampled there. And it's not just with like the seal research with brown bears. We, you know, the state, we'd, we'd work with the state, tranquilize them, put a collar on them, put a permanent tag in the ear and pull a tooth to see how old they are. With scoters, the USGS was shooting them with shotguns, opening their stomachs to see what they ate. With Vancouver, or with uh, Canadian geese, uh, the researchers were hurting them when they couldn't fly and they were molted into pens in the wilderness and they'd take them, anesthetize them, you know, put a, about this size of a transmitter inside them to see where they could fly, where they'd fly to in the winter. 
the irony is they flew over the mountain to the next bay. It wasn't <laughs> it's literally, literally around the corner. But I started, it's like the more you look, the more you see this, and it's really enshrined in our way of being. And it doesn't have to be that way. This is how we did some of the seal research, just observing the seals, counting their numbers, noting how they reacted to vessels. And that's what the seals not even knowing were there. So there, I'm not against science in wilderness, but I do question the need for trammeling. I think it occurs just in an unexamined fashion, and that's just a growing concern of mine. These are some passive bear hair snares we put up to help do a DNA uh, sample, such that we can basically learn you know, the different bears and generations and things without the bears really knowing it. We weren't tranquilizing them or anything. We just get their hair long after they were gone. But there is a lot of this kind of research going on still in the wilderness. And so I've just been asking qu questions about that. I had one other slide on that that I guess I moved elsewhere. I don't have a good segue for this. This is ultimate. <laughs> I was going, man, where do I put this one in there? But this is another funny issue we're having is commercial films in wilderness. And this is uh, basically a reality TV show where they take teams of people into Alaska and then they all try to get from point A to point B. They go their different ways and then someone's filming them as they go and then you can watch it here on TV. And they come to us for film permits. And our current policy is that you can only give them a film permit if they, you know, basically they're not impacting the wilderness, but they're also supposed to kind of realize a purpose of wilderness. And in general, I, sp I spent three days working with these guys, you know, to try and talk to them about wilderness ethics, things like that, and why, you know, how this is, uh, you know, bears are often demonized, and they generally have more to fear from people than people have to fear from bears. And they, oh, yeah, 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 we got it, we got it, got it, no problem. But when they go out, we have all kinds of issues. And so this is like some, I, I don't have time to go over everything that's come up, but like some of the things they've done real quick, they've shredded packs to feign bear attacks in their camp when none ever occurred because they scared all the bears away. On this episode here, this is up north, they were shooting comrades. They were showing guys shooting comrades, which violates the Migratory Bird Act. Um, the interesting part is they actually hire locals who can hunt comrades legally, you know, for subsistence. But in the movie, in the film, they're actually showing like the people from the lower 48 are shooting them, which would be a violation of federal law. They've also done things where they're stealing gear from other outfitters and guides. They've done things where they're, uh, they're catching, they're, they're hunting out of season and things like that. So then it's like, well, is that, should we allow that in wilderness? And part of me is like, you know, wilderness is unconfined. And if you're non-commercial, you can do any film you want. So I don't really care what you're doing. But it gets a little more complicated than that because the Wilderness Act actually has a prohibition on commercial enterprises. And it's caveated, you know, it does say we make an exception, and, but in the exception it says you can, you can allow commercial services to the extent necessary, and a little bit more, for realizing recreational or wilderness purposes. And so it's kind of a, and I also have a colleague who's pretty well versed in law who says it'd be a violation of their First Amendment rights, things, to tell them that they couldn't film whatever they wanted in wilderness. So part of me is like, maybe we should just as long as they have no impacts, they can do whatever they want. But it's an interesting thing. They're kind of giving a message that, you know, in Alaska, the bears will attack you and you can do whatever you want. I'm going to gloss over this for the sake of time. I have just about five minutes. So I'm going to go through a couple real quick. This will be an interesting test in that there's state of Alaska is trying to build an airport in wilderness. Uh, the green is wilderness, and so basically they've got a few options. These are the ones the state favors where the airport is up here in wilderness. It's an airport, not an airstrip. And then there's one option where it's not. And I think this reflects, there's two things this reflects. I think we might see increasing pressures to have this kind of infrastructure, not just airports, but I think water and reservoirs, maybe pipelines to get water to places that need it. There's a, Section 4D4, the Wilderness Act, has provisions that it sets a pretty high bar for these kinds of things to occur. This airport's occurring, or the state's trying to get it through under a Title 11 of the Alaska National Interest Lands Conservation Act, which allows for these kinds of necessary infrastructure if there's nowhere else to kind of put it. And I just fear that we're going to start seeing more infrastructure kind of pressures on wilderness. 
Let me back up for a sec. It, um, and what's also interesting is it's a contractor who's writing this EIS. And they're the ones who are documenting all the impacts to wilderness character. And I think that's also very indicative of a trend we're seeing, is that the agency expertise is going to be outsourced. It's already, a lot of it's been outsourced. But we're going to be seeing contractors writing more about wilderness character. In this case, they're doing, in my opinion, quite a great job. And they've talked to myself and others in the wilderness extensively. And they're saying basically the airport violates every aspect of wilderness character there is when you put it in the wilderness. And it's not as bad when it's not. But this will be an interesting one to see. Um, I'm going to wrap up with just a few more things here real quick because I don't have the time to go into details. But part of this outsourcing is that we're now partnering a lot more with volunteer groups. And it's sort of uh, something we're going to have to get used to more and more. I was just going to show, this is like a, we have an artist residency. It's another way we're trying to, it's something that's grown where we're really trying to connect with the community and get the wilderness education kind of messages out. This is a teacher's trip. And this is working with students. We're, so we're starting to really reach out a little bit more. And largely it's because our own internal capacity is diminished. And we need to get the word out to more people. This is another internal barrier we face. And I'll, I'll spare you any major horror stories, but there's not much of a career ladder for wilderness either within the agency. And that's a huge barrier. We're losing people who are very qualified. We have very qualified people who can't even get in. And it's uh, very demoralizing. And I think it's a little, stands in contrast to like timber or fire, things like that. And I'm going to, I'm going to wrap it up a little uh, before I, f let me back up one sec. One of the questions I have now as a wilderness manager is where is the vision in our agency? We're coming on the, this is the 50th anniversary this year of the Wilderness Act and we have 110 million acres protected. And it's amazing. It's really, when you think about what we've accomplished, pardon. <laughs> But that's actually my fear, though, is that the 50th is going to be a cake and ice cream event, which is good, you know, but it's like cotton candy. I want more substance there. I want to know where, where's the next 110 million acres going to come from? Where's, where's the vision? Where's the leadership in that? And I kind of go back and forth. Do we need that vision or not? Because honestly, I don't know that the guys who originally wrote the Wilderness Act said we're going to get 110 million. That's what we're going for. It's kind of been, I think, in a way, successful beyond its expectations. And in a way, when you look at how wilderness has succeeded, it's often been through the grassroots efforts rather than a real on high vision coming down low. But I do hope as we uh, go forward that I start hearing more and more about how we are going to attain the, you know, both keep the quality of the wilderness that we have, but also acquire yet more wilderness. Because in my opinion, we're really just beginning. Thank you. I'm going to pass the mic on to uh, Andy. Yeah. So my name is Andrew Larson, just to r remind you. And can you fire up our slides? Aha. So I struggled over my title, and I actually decided I don't like it, because it sends, I think, a mixed message. Uh, but, but fundamentally, I want to talk today about uh, what I think is a relatively underappreciated aspect of wilderness, and that's the scientific value or the information value that wilderness areas and wilderness ecosystems offer us. And you know, one of the things, I, I've got sort of a contradiction right there when I say the untrammeled laboratory. And what, what I, what's actually a little bit, uh, I think, mixed about that is the laboratory is a place where you actually manipulate things. and trammel them, right? And I think I probably should have called this the untrammeled observatory. But the idea is that there's a tremendous amount of information that we can obtain from wilderness areas. And this is, I wanted to start with this point because it's something I didn't know until just a couple of years ago. I grew up you know, visiting wilderness, using wilderness areas, but it wasn't until 2010 when I actually read the Wilderness Act and discovered that one of the original defined 
purposes of wilderness was, a scient was scientific usage. So research was actually one of the things that we are supposed to do in federally designated wilderness areas. And I don't often get a chance to say that, so I wanted to make sure that you all left tonight knowing that. Um, I've got three key points that I want to go through tonight. And the first point is that wilderness areas provide value to society as a source of information. And the way we get to that information is through research. Uh, but there's, there's value there beyond uh, the experiences we have as wilderness visitors. There's information and learning that we can, we can do uh, or, or a, acquire from wilderness ecosystems. And a, a really essential point that, I, that we have to make anytime we start talking about science or wilderness in, or research in wilderness areas is that the research that we do, the inferences that we can make, are not limited in their application to the management and understanding of wilderness areas. We can test ideas and, and build theory and apply those lessons outside of the wilderness landscape. And if you're thinking about how do you as a member of the wilderness community make wilderness relevant to broader society, I think that is one of the ways that you can perhaps accomplish that. And then the, th the, the third point that I want to make is that, or that I will make starting right now, is that that value, the information value that, that that wilderness has is just woefully underutilized. We are not doing enough research in wilderness areas. And, and because of that, wilderness areas are not deriving or, or delivering those potential benefits to society. And so I think we need to do more. So I, I'm going to talk about these sort of three different points. And most of the time, I'm going to talk about the second point through the example of some uh, of our work in the Bob Marshall Wilderness right here in Montana. Uh, but I want to start, this is my one slide on my first point. And the, the key point here is that the untrammeled nature of wilderness ecosystems is what gives them scientific value. There are scientific questions, research questions, that can only be answered in wilderness ecosystems. And this aerial photo, I think, really exemplifies a couple of great ecological processes that we can only really study in, eco in wilderness ecosystems. If you're interested in how large river ecosystems work, how mountainous geography and, and, ge and, and geomorphology interacts with riparian plant communities and climate drivers of flow regimes to support things like the, the strongest population of bull trout and West Slope cutthroat trout that remains in, in I think, in North America, or at least the lower 48, you have to, you can only go to a wilderness ecosystem to study those things and learn those things. Because outside of wilderness, our footprint on the landscape is so massive, so overwhelming, that chances are there would be a dam upstream, and so this river would be totally sediment starved. The flow regime would be altered, so the river wouldn't be interacting with the forest anymore, creating these braided channels, recruiting big trees and wood into the river to create fish habitat. We, we can't study those and understand how these systems work and provide the values that, that like fish habitat, that we it, get those important experiences from without going to a wilderness. The same goes for fire. You know, the only places we have intact fire regimes in the lower 48 is in large wilderness areas. And you know, fire is, is really the number one management issue of national forest lands in particular across the West. And if we want to bring any sort of science to bear on the management of fire prone forests, we really have to look to wilderness ecosystems for that information. So. Uh, now, we'll balance that, of course, against the need to maintain the untrammeled character, the untrammeled nature. And so I think a big challenge for researchers is how do we get that information out without ruining the very thing that makes it possible as a source of scientific information. So moving on, I wanted to give you a little bit of, case of a case study here. You know, scientists always have to, uh, we love to talk about ourselves. And so any chance we have to talk about our research, we're going to take it. Uh, and this little bit of story starts with a collaborative group here in uh, northwest Montana in the southwestern crown of the continent, which is the landscape that's outlined in black here. It's the Swan, Clearwater, and Upper Blackfoot River Valleys across three different national forests. And an extremely diverse group of stakeholders came together back in around 2008 to put together a proposal 
uh, under a new federal program that was authorized by the Collaborative Forest Landscape Restoration Act to create this area and obtain some additional funding to do forest restoration. And this was motivated for a number of reasons, but it was motivated because, for one, we know that through fire suppression and fire exclusion, we've fundamentally changed how these forests work. We've also harvested them in the past, to subjected them to different land use practices. And so they're out of bounds uh, with respect to their historical functioning. And when we look at how they used to look under an active fire regime, you see this diverse mosaic of different conditions, different habitats, and after a century of fire suppression, uh, the landscape looks quite a bit different. And that applies at the, at the stand scale as well. And, you know, folks have been grappling with this for decades now in, in Missoula for at least 40 years. How do these forests work? What's fire's role? How do we manage it? All of those sorts of things. Uh, but we haven't got it all figured out yet. And I just want you to have this context um, that the, the group that came together was operating under a set of core values and principles that really emphasized the need to bring the best available science and when there wasn't a lot of science available to bring cautious management and monitoring and adaptive management to bear on that. So how do we go about restoration? How do we uh, meet our management goals in the most scientifically credible way? And I got to introduce you to my main collaborator. This is Travis Belote. He's a research ecologist with the Wilderness Society over in Bozeman. Travis moved to Montana about the same time I did. And, and Travis is a great, great scientist. He's, and he's just fantastic, outgoing guy. And the first time I met Travis, he basically walked into my office, introduced himself. He's like, my name's Travis Belote. I'm a research ecologist. How do we do restoration in mixed severity fire regimes? Which is basically what most of the forests are in the southwestern crown. And what, what they started to realize after they'd written a successful proposal, got the project funded, was that we're working with forest ecosystems that we don't understand as well as other types. So we know the ancient old growth forests from the Pacific coast very, very well. We know how they work. We know how they develop. We know what to do to restore them. Similarly, we know how ponderosa pine forests in Arizona work. Fire burns all the time. We have a very mature scientific understanding, and we know how to restore them. Montana forests, on the other hand, are, are still, to, to a large degree, a scientific mystery. We haven't figured it out yet. And so we've got all these open questions. You know, how do we go into a managed fire-excluded forest, and what actions are appropriate to take to restore it, to meet those objectives that we have? Anyway, so Travis uh, organized a field trip that first summer and that was in July of 2010. We went up into the swan, spent the day kicking around, brainstorming, trying to come up with ideas. And at the end of the day, it was, it was actually very humbling because I had to say, you know, I don't know what the hell we're supposed to do. You know, all of my background, all my training kind of leaves me hanging here. I, I don't have dogma that I can just turn to or practices that are really refined. And what we realized was that we we're going to have to basically get creative. And a month later, we were in the Bob, the Bob Marshall Wilderness on a personal trip. So August 2010, and, and you know, we were in the high country having a great time. We were pack rafting down the river. You know, we were wilderness consumers. And we got down into the South Fork Flathead Valley, and the forests were just mind-blowing. The forests, I, I, they were unlike anything I'd, I'd seen or imagined. And what, was, what you need to know about the South Fork Valley is since the early 80s, fire has basically been let off the leash. And the wilderness managers and the Bob Marshall Wilderness have returned fire to a near natural role. And outside of a very few places in the western US, you don't, you don't have that. And so we have, in the Bob, a relatively short period of fire suppression in a forest ecosystem that, that doesn't burn super frequently. And so that, that period of fire suppression uh, certainly disrupted the system, but not to the magnitude of, say, forests in northern Arizona. And then for 30 years or so now, we've had a very active regime of fire. And so what we realized walking through all this forest is that, you know, we had the answer to this question of how do we do restoration of mis mixed severity forest ecosystems, mixed severity fire regimes, basically just right over the ridge. All we had to do was walk from Sealy Lake or walk from Holland Lake 
up over the divide and drop down into the South Fork Valley and we would start getting some of the answers right there. And so the next summer, that's what we set out to do, uh, was to take uh, you know, some, some very straightforward measurements and try to answer some, some basic questions about how these systems work, what sort of effects uh, are fires having here, and then how can we apply that back to the problem of management outside of the reserve landscape in the, in the southwestern crown. And you can see this picture right here. You know, this is a map of fires in just the last 14 years in our study area. And we've got places that have burned multiple times now. So the same point on the landscape, in some cases, have burned three times in, since uh, 88 already. So here's a little bit of research I'll just quickly go through. And this is actually this piece it's just a small part of, it, of what we've produced so far, uh, but this is student-led research by a wilderness and civilization student from two years ago was actually this, the, the lead author on this paper that I'm going to describe. But we, we asked, you know, basically what I've just been describing to you, what can we learn about restoration? Or if we look at these active fire regime forests in the wilderness, what does it suggest to us about how we might change, improve, alter forest management practices to meet those restoration goals? And we had a, a really fortunate case study to, to pair a site inside wilderness, a site outside of wilderness. And one of the first restoration treatments was done up at Sealy Lake in the Girard Grove. It's a spectacular old growth forest, large dominated forest. It was thinned in 2002 and burned in a prescribed fire in 2003. In 2003, we had big fires burn all through the bob without suppression. So we have a natural wildfire and a prescribed wildfire in very similar old growth large forests that burned in the same year. So we're able to control for a lot of different variables and set up this great contrast. And we asked some just very straightforward questions here. We're interested in what sort of variability was created by that fire versus the prescribed fire. So we wanted to know about patterns of tree survival versus tree mortality. We wanted to know uh, what sort of regeneration, so what after the fire, what sort of successional pathways do we see in the thinning versus the, versus the wildfire? And then what about coarse woody debris? Because coarse woody debris feeds the soil. Coarse woody debris is habitat for a number of organisms, and it's something in, in fuels reduction and restoration treatments we often minimize. And so we wanted to know, you know, what goes on in a natural system. So the first thing we did was just to go out and sample across this landscape and say, what's just what's the fire doing in terms of mortality? And the, the thing that hopefully jumps out at you is this, there's this extraordinary range of variation caused by the fire. We have everything from complete stand replacement to unburned islands and everything in between. And that creates this incredibly wide range of habitats. And these habitats are occurring within really close spatial location of each other. So you can move from one place to across the other side of the room and be in a totally different environment. So we have everything from that to something like this to a relatively hot, burned out spot, the whole spectrum. And if we zoom in, so the next thing says, okay, what if we zoom in to the scale of which um, you know, a thinning crew is going to go through a forest and implement a fuel reduction treatment, or which a tree marking crew is going to walk through with a paint can and say, that tree goes, that tree stays, that tree goes. What sort of patterning do we see at that spatial scale in the wildfire system in the wilderness versus the thin system? And so we made those sorts of measurements. And these, what I'm showing you here, are maps of tree locations. And so this is just a 2D map view. The dots are where the trees are, and the color gradient in the background shows distance away from a tree, so how, basically how open it is. So we've got the pre-burn condition here in the wilderness, the pre-treatment -pre condition here at Sealy Lake. And then if we look ahead to what the conditions look like after treatment, one of the things, and we see this over and over and over and over again, is that we people are, are we love uniformity. It's like it's what we are so good at creating. And fire, on the other hand, gave us everything from these dense closed canopy conditions to great big open areas. And that has consequences uh, for a host of things, inclu including the sort of light environment that is creating the understory that, that the understory plants in the next generation of trees experience. 
And so if you look at this, this is the same data what uh, I'm showing, but, but reduced to show basically change. And so the darker background here shows that you've got areas of basically no change, which is the white, to the dark colors represent big change. And so you can see the effect of that fire is to induce much more variation than our thinning treatment is. So what about trees? What about the next generation? Well, it's a simple answer. 10 times more tree regeneration after the fire. And in fact, you know, one of the goals, this is like the, the main thing that we learned, we already knew this actually, foresters had, had figured this out 50 years ago, Larch needs fire. Larch is one of the most fire-dependent species from a population perspective in, in the West. It has this extraordinary affinity for burned, exposed soils. And what, we, what happened is the prescribed fire here wasn't hot enough, and it didn't create the environment that was suitable to regenerate the species that they were trying to regenerate. And so the, that, that wildfire was much more effective at perpetuating, maintaining a new, or, you know, establishing a new population. And then this is no surprise here whatsoever, hopefully to anybody. If we look at how much wood is on the ground, just large diameter wood, well, there's about three times more in the wilderness area. And this shouldn't be surprising because they put all the big logs on the log truck and took them to the mill and the thinning site. But just to give you some images, you know, we did really good at, at, at retaining the large trees that, that that you know everybody values that ha that we that we know are important, but when we look across other elements, particularly the woody debris and also the tree regeneration, we see that really we missed the mark. And so, a couple of things to sum up here. These are these are obvious. I've already said them all, but just let me hit them, hit you with them once more. <coughs> Wildfire is random. Okay, it does things. It induces that variation that we are just not very good at doing. We like organization. We've got more and faster growing regeneration after the wildfire, dramatically more. Ten times more trees, they're growing 50% as fast. Okay, so again, one and a half times faster growth rate. One of the things, I didn't give you any data to prove this, but one of the analyses that we're doing right now is that we're seeing there are multiple different pathways of post-fire development going on. And so you've got more diverse plant communities and more diverse developmental pathways occurring after the fire. More woody debris, obviously. Uh, in this greater, when you put all those things together, what we're seeing is there's much greater dynamism, the turnover is, is happening faster. The rates of processing, the demographics are all going quicker in the wilderness system. And so what does this mean for management? So what can we apply outside of wilderness? What are our inferences from studying this system to the problem of management of restoration outside of wilderness? Well, one of the things, this is actually, hopefully this will make the environmentalists mad, uh, is that we need to harvest more. We didn't hit the system hard enough to overcome the history of fire suppression or to regenerate the tree species that we we're trying to maintain. We've got to leave more wood behind. We've got to feed the soil. We've got to burn hotter, which is something that is, of course, very, very challenging when you start talking about you know, a place where people live and being in the, in the, the rural urban uh, interface. But more than, more than anything else, if we, if we step away from sort of the specific things that you say, you know, fuels manager or forester, here are the recommendations about what tree you should leave versus what tree you should take, fine. But if we step back and say, what does this really mean about our understanding of forest ecosystems and mixed severity fire regimes, and especially with respect to, to restoration? And I think what comes from that is that we need to, to, to reevaluate our, our mental image of what the ideal forest is, of what we're trying to restore to. And most of the, of the forest ecology research that's happened for really like the last century emphasizes old growth forests as being these stable systems. Sure, they're turning over, but they're slow, they're maintained, and we know what they look like. But when you come to the, the forests of the northern Rockies, they're not defined by stability. In fact, they're defined by change. And sometimes that change is really really large in terms of magnitude. And so we have to, I think, challenge ourselves in that way in terms of just our basic mental image of what restoration means or what sustainable forests mean in the fire-prone northern Rockies. So 
I want to switch gears now and come back to that third bullet point and, and, and deal with just briefly this question of why doesn't more research happen in wilderness? Because relatively very little does. You know, Missoula and the University of Montana and the, the Forest Service uh, RMRS research station research groups here do do a lot of work in the wilderness. But when you look across all of the ecological research that goes on, a tiny, tiny fraction happens in, in wilderness ecosystems. And I can tell you from, from a scientist perspective, someone who does work, there's some very simple you know, mostly logistical reasons. You know, and one is that it, it, it takes longer. It, I mean, fundamentally, it's harder to do the same types of activities in a different place. You've got to, you've got to work harder. It costs more. There's more stress involved. And so just to go into the Bob, it takes us two to three days to get to our study sites in the Bob Marshall Wilderness, whereas to get to the Gerard Grove study site in Sealy Lake, I drive you know, 50 to 60 minutes, drive up, walk 100 meters into the stand. Uh, and that translates into logistics. So to get just even basic equipment into the field, you know, you can't get all of your gear, all your food, and all the field equipment. And so that means we have to start turning to other modes of transportation, uh, which then adds expense on top of that. And so, you know, the logistics are simple. You know, it's, it's, the logistics are com complex, but the explanation is simple when we look across those things. But there's, there's more to it than that. And, the, the, the last three things are, these are what I'll call hypotheses, I guess. Um, sort of my brainstorming about why don't we have more active research? Why aren't we fulfilling the, one of the original purposes of wilderness as defined by the, the, the Wilderness Act? And I think one of it has to do with scientists. Scientists are um, narrow-minded, egomaniacal people. And we don't like to flex. We don't like to change. And, you know, when we, when we have a, a method, I'm speaking for myself mostly, that we know we've used for a long time, and we want to apply it in a wilderness area, but it's not consistent with wilderness character, and it would result in a trampling, well, it's easier to just say, you know, the hell with it. I'm not going to do work there. It's pain in the ass. I don't want to bother. So I think that might be one thing that feeds into it. Uh, I think that there's some that go, there's, there's sort of attitudes that, that, and um, understandings of what wilderness is for and all about. And I fortunately have never encountered this. And we have really uh, supportive and a good relationship with the managers and the Bob. But other wilderness areas, in, in one particular project uh, that we have in a California uh, I'm just going to stay. It's in California. We really encountered a culture uh, on, in the management community that was just straight up anti-wilderness. Excuse me, anti-research in wilderness. Uh, and so, you know, there was just some ideology that was just said, you know, it's incompatible. And so, I think in some cases there's barriers that come up there. Uh, and then I, I think this was my bright idea. I think one thing that um, that would help overcome the limitations that managers have and the limitations that researchers had is if there was more clearer and stronger demand for wilderness science, particularly from the wilderness user community and, and just the natural resource management community in general. And, and in fact, uh, wilderness is sometimes discriminated against. And I'll give you an example. So the, the number one go-to research funding source for fire ecology and fire management research is the Joint Fire Sciences Program. And this year, they had a call for research on fire-on-fire -fire interactions. So they want to understand how do fires change the behavior of or the probability of the next fire when it occurs. And, and the best, and in a lot of cases, only place you can really go to answer that question, at least in a credible way, is in a wilderness area. Because that's the only place we have active fire regimes. But they specifically said in their call, do not send us proposals to work in wilderness. We're not interested in working in wilderness. And you think about it, that funding community, they fund the fire suppression, fuels management, forest management community. None of those activities go on in wilderness. They're, they're, they're forbidden. That would represent a trampling. And so there's a disconnect that, that in fact shouldn't be there and need not be there uh, that sometimes sets up. And so I think if we had stronger demand uh, from, from 
I'll say, downstream users for saying, hey, you know, one of the, one of the things that we get from wilderness is information that will help us more sustainably, more responsibly manage non-wilderness areas. Let's see some more of it. That might help overcome some of that. So that's all I've got for you. I'm a minute over time. Thank you for letting me share these thoughts. Okay, so questions for our speakers, and please just address who you would like to address your question to, and speakers, please paraphrase the question if possible. Questions? Apparently. <laughs> yes. Your name is Alaska. What's your name again? Kevin. Kevin? Kevin. So you had that whatever you call your official form of how to get how your room is doing in your past and where it's going in your grading system. Yes. Could you maybe incorporate that into like what he's talking about with one of your struggles of having the contingency of wilderness research? Maybe have the users fill that out? Okay, so the question is it maybe is there some way like uh, to use something similar to the scoring kind of regimen we've used for other uh, wilderness management uh, areas and maybe to apply it to the... Well, I'll just go on for a second. Okay. So, like, sorry. That's all right. Do you want to score those? Yeah, it's a joint effort. We do kind of, we all get together, we talk about who scored what, and it's reviewed a few times by different folks. So, like, wouldn't, I mean, I'm kind of speculating here, but, like, wouldn't you be wanting to grade yourself lower to maybe increase funding, like we need to. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, okay, so the, uh, it's kind of a multiple part question, right? I'll, I'll go with the last part first. When we're trying to score ourselves, uh, is there any incentive to score lower in order to get maybe more funding? Um, I think that's actually countered pretty readily just by the work ethic of almost everyone involved, to be honest. Most people don't want to go out and purposely tank. Um, and actually, we're all already pretty hard graders on ourselves, at least where I'm from. We really grade ourselves hard, and we're always getting on each other. And you're not doing it for funding, because uh, the funding is not as uh, there's, A, not that much funding for this in the first place. So you're, you're um, and what funding does come to you is largely disconnected <laughs> from that as well. As we are getting to the conclusion of this challenge, this is the 10th year of the 10-year Wilderness Stewardship Challenge. The, the wildernesses that are just about there, but not quite, are the ones that are, I think, at the highest priority. But also built into the screening for that is show your capacity, show what you've been doing. And you can't, if you've been tanking all along, you're, you're not going to score well in that regard. So they, this, the people are mindful of gaming the system, but uh, I think that there are enough checks that it doesn't happen on a widespread basis. And then another part was, could fire research maybe be incorporated into that? And the, the first element actually in that challenge is fire, and it does include wilderness managers working very closely. It's not so much with researchers, but the managers working with the fire managers themselves about having a plan for what are we going to do when there is a fire in wilderness are we going to at what point you know basically w what tools will we use can we use minimal tools like crosscut saws maybe axes or just let it go <laughs> excuse me just let it go um you know and agree upon ahead of time where would you need to actually like defend a structure or something so there is some of that built in and it would not be hard at all to fold fire research you know to plan out further ahead into that grading system and i would hope that will occur as we move into wilderness character monitoring and those wilderness areas that have fire will include that kind of research along with the planning to make sure that what they're doing is sound can i just yeah, say one thing there i think one of the things that that you know i have sort of a, a taxonomy of of wilderness research i think of there's sort of three major classes, maybe. There's um, research that basically asks questions about what values do we get, either as individuals or as a society or an economy, from wilderness areas. 
And so that's how does wilderness make you feel? Uh, what values, like can we put a dollar amount on services provided? There's a second set that I would uh, call sort of applied wilderness management research, which are questions that, that directly respond to wilderness management. So, uh, and, I, and that's where I would put wilderness character monitoring. And then there's a, a third flavor, which is what I was talking about, which is sort of wilderness ecosystem research. So uh, where we can ask questions and, and answer questions, hopefully, about how ecosystems that happen to be in untrammeled wilderness areas function. Um, so anyway, I wanted to just get that out there. But the, the key, key thing um, I wanted to add to this monitoring question was, you know, it'd be interesting to ask the question, what impacts are research activities having on wilderness character or, or on a visitor experience so that we could bring some, and, and I don't know if that happens, and maybe it already does. Uh, but that's, I guess, a way that I could, could, could see reacting to your proposal or your question there. Other questions? In the, all the way in the back. So the, the question is, are there, and if so, what are they, standards and guidelines for what sort of research activities are appropriate in wilderness, and allowable in wilderness areas, and what aren't? Is it, did I capture that? I'm going to defer to the manager. <laughs> That's a good question. Um, the short answer is, there's not enough standardization. There are a few guidelines, um, but they're not, they're very general and broad, and each agency has different guidelines. There is, there are some non-policy, like just sort of uh, guidance documents about how you could assess the impacts of scientific activities in wilderness. There's one of those that Peter Landris was the lead author on, but not all agencies use that. Not all researchers are aware of it. One of the slides I must have inadvertently cut, I have a picture from the how to conduct wilderness research in Alaska. And what the picture I put up is out of their wilderness research brochure, kind of the centerfold picture has a helicopter in, wilder in the Denali wilderness with a wolf that's been tranquilized and they're putting a collar on it. <laughs> and I'm going, man, that's not the picture I would put in my, <laughs> I mean, you know, and I mean, to be fair, there might be something where they had to go that far. But what I would be wanting to say is that should be the very last resort. Just, just because there's a scientific value to wilderness, I want to make that very clear. But there's even higher value of having a wild wilderness. And they get inverted a lot. And I think you were great with, you know, when you listed some of the reasons and things about why is it difficult for research to occur in wilderness, I think there is a little bit of a disconnect between managers and researchers. And I think that gap needs to close. Um, and so I always try to come back with, well, you'd like to go in with a helicopter. We don't go there with helicopters. Why don't you do it the way we do it, you know, kind of thing. Um, and it's interesting because it, a lot of times they'll say, well, we can't do it that way. And I'm like, oh, okay, well, you know, you could probably find a place somewhere else. And then like a week later, they'll be, okay, We'll do it that way, you know. <laughs> it's, it's kind of, it's, so it takes a little while, but I also I try to say, well, what are you trying to learn? You know, maybe there's better ways. Maybe we don't have to go right there or somewhere it's harder to get to. Maybe there's an easier way. So, I, but I do think we need to spend more time working together, um, and uh, we're getting there. I think things are are. I think we have a ways to go, but I I think people are becoming more aware of these kinds of impacts, especially like with wilderness character monitoring and with sort of a scientific evaluation documents, we're starting to assess more and more of these impacts and trying to minimize them ahead of time. So we're getting there. There's another, yes? Uh, this is for you, Kevin. Uh, well, of, is there any research going on about like, monitoring visitor expectations to wilderness or what their idea of this wilderness and how do you think that's changed? That's a good question. The question is, is there any research going on about uh, what visitor expectations are going to wilderness? 
Uh, there definitely is research on that. I'll be honest, I'm not totally uh, up on it, unfortunately. Alan Watson would be a great one to ask here at the uh, Aldo Leopold Institute. Um, I can say, from what I've seen, and this is something I've talked at length with, and I think maybe others who have experience. One thing we're seeing is, when I first started in Alaska, when I did run into kayakers, they were going out for like a week-long trip. And the companies that do the week-long kayak trips have largely folded and gone under. Or some of them have changed to where they now do these B&B &B trips. So you can go out for a day trip, they'll have a boat drop you off in the morning, paddle for a couple hours, you get back in the afternoon, you'll be sleeping on a feather bed in a, in a structure somewhere. And then you'll go out to a different place the next day, you get dropped off, paddle around, but you're not camping anymore. And so I think there's a, a trend towards fewer people going out for long wilderness stints. It might be because it's harder to make it. Most people are having to work at least one job, if not two, to get by. You might not be able to get the time off. It might be more a reflection of a disconnect as more of us are spending more time on computers and things and just not thinking about allocating our time that way too. I have some concern about that, but there's definitely far fewer folks going out for longer term uh, trips. And the people who do come up are often, I'll have more concern over the wilderness. For them, like coming to Alaska for the first time, it's like when I was first there, it's all wild and outstanding. There's no impacts. You know, that's sort of the original. It takes a little while. And I think that's probably true anywhere, you know. When you first get somewhere, there's a novelty that takes a little while before you start seeing some of the uh, things that might concern you. <coughs> you only speak from my own perspective. <laughs> I want to catch big fish and I don't want to see any other people. <laughs> <laughs> That's not a change. <laughs> other questions? Yes. I have a question for Kevin. Um, you were talking about um, monitoring visible air conditions. And with that, you were talking about suggested practices for cruise ships. Could you talk a little more about how you monitor for the air emissions and what kind of success you've had with the cruise ships? <laughs> Yeah, that's a good question. The question is, how do you, essentially, how do you monitor the uh, visual air emissions of cruise ships? Essentially, what you have to do is you have to have the sun more or less in behind you. You have to be moving at the same speed of the ship, so you're in your skiff, and you're looking through the plume of their emissions where it's darkest, and you're telling how much of the background is obscured and it's a percentage rating. And they're by law allowed to go up to 20%, uh, so they can obscure up to 20%. It's, uh, most car exhaust is less than 20%. I mean, you know, it's a bad example when it's really cold out and everything's, but, um, and you get trained that way. You go to these e the EPA training or the EPA contractor trainings and you have to read 50 white smokes, 50 black smokes, and you you're only allowed to be off by about 7.5% as an average, so there's some play in it. It's it's actually pretty interesting how uh, how unscientific it is in a sense. It, there's and what I actually think is it was originally designed so people could get permits to conduct industry and, and monitor themselves. And oh yeah, we were in compliance. But the irony is now when you're doing it to check industry, they actually have lasers in their stack, and it reads it to the 100,000th decimal as to what their opacity is. In my eyes, you know, well, yeah, it looked like 20% to me. That beats that laser. <laughs> it's just the way the law is. Part of it's that I'm reading it outside of the stack. And they're, one of the things that's unique in our area is their emissions react with the very moist atmosphere. So it's a kind of a characteristic of our area. And it gets to be very dense once it hits that moist atmosphere. There's uh, some of the sulfur in the exhaust reacts. and. Uh, so part of it's like I'm, they're measuring it where it's still hot and clean in the stack. I'm measuring it where it's reacted outside. And that's how the law reads, though. It's how you're supposed to do it. Um, and if we have a reading of interest, we'll call them on the radio and tell them we have a reading of interest. And then we meet with the DEC afterwards. And they're going to, the DEC is the Department of Environmental Conservation. And they'll decide if they're going to go to uh, give them a citation or not for $15,000, $30,000. And most of the time, it won't go to that. Um, there's lots of technicalities, lots of lawyers, and not a lot of political will, frankly, to see a lot of those violations go forward. That's it in a nutshell.
Okay. Go ahead. Things you talked about was, you know, there's big wilderness areas that are really great because they're, you know, they're somewhat functional as their own ecosystem. But there's so many wilderness areas that aren't of enough size to do that. What is the role of those in the scientific research side of things? It's just as important. You, you can't answer some of the same questions that I used in my example here because you haven't got uh, fire in the same way, for example. I mean, it could be that fires don't burn. I mean, if you look at like Death Valley or something, you couldn't answer questions about rivers or fires there. But there are other, other ecosystem questions that we'd be able to address there. So uh, the opportunities and the topics are certainly going to scale. Um, but I'll give you an example from the, I can't even remember the name of the wilderness area. It's, it's the wilderness area on the Oregon side of the Columbia River Gorge, right on the crest of the Cascades where they bump into the Columbia River. And it's a relatively recent wilderness area. And uh, we had permanent plots in there where we were studying forest development and tree population dynamics and causes and rates of tree mortality in those natural forest ecosystems uh, before the wilderness was actually designated. Uh, and so those studies have continued. And, and uh, you know, we've got studies like that that go on in Olympic National Park, for example, in the wilderness there as well. So, you know, even, even small little postage stamp places do, do provide some, some research opportunities. Yeah, how, how do you, um, like, educate people and, like, researchers versus, like, down here as peers to, like, look at and touch it? Well, wilderness and civilization program. Yeah, let me let me re so the, let me re rephrase or paraphrase and correct me if I get it wrong. Um, so the question is, what what are the opportunities to educate folks about the potential uh, research value of wilderness? Is that okay? Um, well. Programs like the Wilderness and Civilization program or this lecture series are one, one way, but that's a self-selecting demographic. And so uh, I think, boy, this is a good question. So that's like the classic scientist's problem. We get so focused on our research questions that we don't make it relevant to the rest of society. Um, but I think reaching out to wilderness users who normally don't in, inter interact with uh, or engage in sort of the science side of things might be a first step. But I don't know, that's a question that I should turn back to the audience and say, how do we cultivate an interest in and appreciation for scientific value of wilderness? If you have ideas, I would like to hear them. We can do it afterwards, though. Um, I have a question in terms of the vision of wilderness in the future you're talking about. Um, and and the aspect of jurisdiction. And um, on the one hand, in Alaska, you have the state that probably wants as much tourism money as possible for these cruise ships. And yet it's a federal agency that's, that's controlling the land. Um, and then you have no fisheries that are controlling the wildlife in the water. And it's a different jurisdiction between all of them. So moving forward, you're saying there's not as much funding in, in general for wilderness um, management. So what's the, the future of those jurisdiction and state, federal, um, what's your vision of that? <laughs> That's a simple one. Um, <laughs> the question is what's, what's the vision going forward for wilderness management when it's a real complicated situation. We have federal land management of the wilderness, the water, there's like the state overall wants more tourism, probably not much restrictions and there's no uh, like in charge of the marine mammals and things like that. It's kind of a complicated scenario. Um, I'll be honest. I think we're going to have to start thinking beyond jurisdictions pretty soon, um, just because the reality is the ecosystems don't follow those. And I also think we need to break down some false dichotomies as well um, and also look at maybe different kinds of zoning and things. I think there's sort of a wilderness has a negative perception as the land of no, you know, like if you have wilderness, you're not going to have tourism and stuff. But if the number 
I can't remember what the number one reason is, but it's the number two reason people even go to Alaska is because to see wilderness. Number one's probably to catch a fish and eat it, <laughs> something like that. But, um, you know, so one of the main reasons people are going there is because it's there. You know, the part of the, I, I cut short for time, but where I actually see tremendous vision, where I get a lot of hope is in what's going on in Europe right now. And uh, they have, I often think it's bad. Oh God, I have no, you know, my staff's going down, my budget's going down, you know, and it's uh, gonna get worse. And then you go talk to the Europeans and they're like in Bulgaria, they don't even have an agency, they don't even have a law, they have no staff, no budget, and it's all private property. And, and, they're, like, and they're working for wilderness and it kind of gives you some perspective. Like, well, maybe it's not quite so bad here. And then they join the EU and they're under like 50, you know, I've got jurisdictional problems. They're under like, you know, there's the EU and there's all these different commissions and unions. But in Europe, what they're trying to do is they've pledged to, they're going to try and it, people question whether they'll make it. They have less than 1%, you know, as wilderness, probably a lot less than 1%. But they're trying to designate 5% of Europe as wilderness by 2030. And what's happening and what's very interesting is they're having a tremendous migration right now to the urban areas. And the numbers I've seen is they're predicting in the next 10, 15 years, they're going to have, I've seen between 30 million and 70 million hectares, you know, hectares, so about, you know, whatever, 70 million to 130, 140 plus million acres of lands kind of opening up. And what's really interesting is they've been measuring their wildlife populations. They've doubled their brown bear population. It's, it's up to like 17,000 now in the last, 15 years or so they have way more uh, their wolf populations are going up their white tailed eagles are going up they have all these and they're they're pretty they're animals that are fairly sensitive to the human presence and all these populations are starting to go up and part of it's because these areas are opening up and so I think in a way we're gonna have to I think use the term get creative when you're trying to you know sort of resolve things when you're a little flummoxed at the time and one of the ways, one of the things I see great potential for here in the U.S. that they're doing over there is they have all these abandoned Eastern European Soviet military bases, and they're turning those into wilderness. And it's it's kind of easy because they have so much unexploded ordnance there that you can't go anywhere. <laughs> but they have wolves moving in, and uh, it was actually funny. We toured one. I had to sign the "Don't kick the ordnance," and I'm like, "Yeah, whatever." And I opened the door, and there's like a shell right there, and I was like, "Oh, I guess it's that bad." But it's their number one cause of fires there. This is actually a great fire study. They have more. <laughs> it's, it's, de it's munitions that are degrading and they just spontaneously ignite. Not only that, when they're burning, you hear explosions going on in the woods. So nobody goes off the roads there. But we, in the United States, we got 58 million acres of military bases, if I remember right. I think that's the number. It's in the tens of millions for sure. And you think about it, we're going into an age of austerity where, and the defense, you know, the defense is at least 60% of the federal budget. So they're going to get cut. And we've already heard of base closures and things. And what better place? I mean, we know wilderness is hard to pass, but man, if you have a, go get some bombing ranges and who's going to go there? <laughs> so I think we're going to have to get, and it'll be a little tricky. There's going to be, you know, jurisdictional and territorial turf things, but I think we're going to have to start getting creative and uh, not being limited by where the political stripes land. Thank you. We, we're done for time, but if folks want to come up afterwards and continue conversations, feel free. So thanks for coming and hopefully we'll see you next week. Thank you.